Okay, class, welcome to lecture three. This lecture is on soils. You might have heard soils mentioned in the video you just watched, in the Project Home video. A lot was uh, mentioned about soils, but not much emphasis was really put on exactly what constitutes soils. By my, my background is in soils, so what I earned my PhD in and what I went and did my master's in was soil so soils are something that are somewhat near and dear to me although this isn't a class that revolves so much around soils so I'm only gonna spend this one lecture on soils of course we will be referring to soils throughout the semester when we talk about other issues in the class the first topic I want to cover is that soils are not dirt. Dirt is what you bring in on the bottom of your shoes. Soils, it, this was mentioned in the videos, but soils you have to remember are the interface between the atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, and the geosphere. It's kind of that interface to where all these different components of the Earth's surface connect. If you were to take a scoop of soil and look at it underneath a microscope, you would see that it's filled with thousands upon thousands, if not millions, of microorganisms. It is, is very much a living, breathing entity. It's not what you might think of in terms of if you have dirt. Ye, dirt is not that larger connected ecosystem. So for the purposes of this lecture and for the purpose of the rest of the class, when we talk about soil, we want to think of it as a living, breathing entity that's connecting so many different facets of the Earth's surface and of the Earth's atmosphere. The other portion we want to look at is that soils do not equal sediments. For those of you in here with a geology background, you might think of soil as what you just dig up from the ground no matter how far down it is or wherever you go. If you go to the beach and you're down by the water and you scoop up some of that beach sand, that's not soil. And indeed, you hear people who have might have talked about layers of soil, you hear about geologists saying this. Soils are not found in layers. Soils develop into horizons. Sediments are deposited in layers. So if you're out west, or you might remember from the video that footage of out west when they're talking about the carbonates trapped in rocks, these are all different layers from a diff from a former sedimentary environment from some shallow inland sea. Soils develop into horizons, and those horizons aren't deposited in layers; they develop through different actions in the soil. And though all those different horizons have names, and each one of those horizons have different purposes that they serve. We look at this, these horizons on soils, which is our skin of the planet, and we can break it down into different categories. Now, not all soils are going to have the same thickness of horizon. We're going to take a look at some different soils here in the lecture later, and you're going to see that not all soils are the same. Some have thicker, certain thicker horizons than other ones. The first horizon we want to look at when we think of soil is the O horizon. Now the O horizon is something that if you are from uh, an environment where you have a lot of bogs, then you might know what an O horizon is because the O horizon is that top horizon of soil that is just organic matter. There's no sand grains, there's no mineral grains in an O horizon. If you want to think of the O horizon here in uh, the Eau Claire area, the O horizon is going to get a lot thicker in these next few weeks because what we're going to be experiencing is fall. And when the leaves fall off the trees, all of those leaves falling off the trees are going to comprise the O horizon. Right now, if you go into the forest, there's probably very few leaves because the worms and the microbes have broken them down. But if you get all out in the forest in the spring of the year, you'll see an old horizon. Of course, this varies by the forest type. If you're in an environment with oak leaves or in pine 
trees, white pine trees, that old horizon is going to be all of those pine needles that have built up in a lot of cases over the years. <coughs> An A horizon is the horizon that a lot of you in this class are probably familiar with if you've ever done any digging around your backyard or if you've noticed uh, anything excavated before or if you're into gardening as well. The A horizon is that top horizon of mineral matter mixed with humus. So humus is the organic matter that's broken down. And really all of the material in the A horizon, if you were to cook that in an oven and cook off that 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 organic matter, the A horizon would look like a bunch of red grains of soil, or if you bleached it off, it would just look like beach sand. But it's black because of all that organic matter in the soil. If you're into gardening and you or you know someone who's into gardening, you, you would know how people get really excited when they see that really dark, dark, black, black topsoil. That's because that is a lot of organic matter. That organic matter has a lot of nutrients in it that the plants will like to eat off of. The E horizon is a horizon that's not always around in all different environments. When you think of an E horizon, you want to think of a soil that's sandy. Oftentimes it's in a cool, moist climate. So if you're from areas of northern Wisconsin or northern Minnesota and you have sandy soils, you might have seen an E horizon before because this is definitely a northern forest soil. I'll show you a picture of an E horizon so you can get a better idea of what it looks like. The E horizon is leached. So all the materials in the E horizon are leached out of it. They're picked up by the water and they're brought down. And so those white grains, that's actually what the A horizon would look like if it didn't have that organic matter covering the grains. It's bleached, if you would. And so it's a zone of eluviation. Eluviating means that the particles are leaving and leaching. Stuff is getting leached out. When you see an E horizon in a soil, it means that the soil isn't very productive. In northern Wisconsin and Minnesota, you'll sometimes you'll come across an area that used to be in farmland, but it was abandoned and it was on these soils that were sandy with these E horizons. Oftentimes those soils are very acidic and they're not really well suited for farming. They're good for things like uh, red pine plantations, but as you saw in the video, Going with that monoculture isn't always a good idea. However, many would argue that planting some trees is better than no trees at all. Below the E horizon is the B horizon. Now, the B horizon is another horizon that many of you may have seen before if you've been digging in your backyard or if you've noticed people digging. And that's when, as soon as you get a, a, down deep enough away from the A horizon, you'll start encountering that horizon that has a reddish tint to it often. This is where all the material that's leached down in the soil, coming from up here and sometimes from up in the E horizon, is illuviated or deposited. Remember, immigrants go are at a place, emigrants leave. So everything is illuviated to here, into your B horizon. The B horizon is where the stuff ends up. It's where the stuff is transported to that got washed out from below or from above. Finally, if you dig down far enough in a soil, you'll come across what's known as the C horizon. The C horizon is your unaltered parent material or your partially altered. So this is when you start getting into the, the, the true sediment of what the soil formed in. Sometimes you have a C horizon that's mostly weathered bedrock if you have a soil that formed over bedrock. In northern Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, northern Midwest where the glaciers came, oftentimes we're dealing with soils that aren't over bedrock. It's just all these deposits. That's not always like that. Many soils in the world have formed right over bedrock and you don't have as thick of soils as you do in areas such as the northern Midwest. Finally, if you go far enough down with the soil, you're going to hit your unweathered parent material. This is your pure sediments or your unaltered bedrock. This is what, if you're a geologist, this is what you are interested in. And oftentimes, soils to the geologist is something that is really not of importance. It's, it's the unaltered stuff below. Soils, in a lot of ways, are an overlooked resource. We have a lot of issues going on with soils around the world 
what we're going to take a look at when we visit agriculture is how soils can be very much a renewable resource but if they're not utilized properly, and what you saw that you saw us in the video as well if soils aren't used, utilized properly, they can erode away or they can lose other nutrients and they be, can become a non-renewable resource we're having issues with soils becoming physically and chemically degraded in the United States, if you go to a place like Iowa, many places in Iowa, you're driving along the side of the road, you can see the orangish color in the soils. That's because the topsoil has been eroded away. And if it weren't for the fertilizers, those fields would not yield what they tend to produce. If we get into the areas like the southeast of the country, you have lots and lots of problems of soil erosion, gully erosion. We take a look at this map and we can just looking at this map we can see that oftentimes when it comes to growing in an environment there are limiting factors. There are very few areas in the world that are conducive for agriculture at a large scale without engaging in some degradational process. And indeed, when we start looking at forestry and we, when we look at agriculture, we're going to see that many of the new agricultural frontiers are in former rainforest lands. They mentioned this in the video in terms of what happens when a rainforest is cleared. It gets often gets put into cattle production or soy production or some type of a plantation tree production. And oftentimes those soils are of a type that don't really have a very high nutrient content. There's many limiting factors when it comes to soils. You can't just think of a soil as across the board the same around the world. And I, not even nearly all the time, all the time a soil will have at least one limiting factor. What we look at and what farmers will look at is how severe is the limiting factor. When you get into things like continuous cold, you're going to be dealing with, unless you start getting into greenhouses, having to grow crops that have an extremely short growing season. However, if you're dealing with dryness issues, then you can look at things like irrigation. However, what we're going to visit is that irrigation isn't always a sustainable long-term process and by over irrigating you can salinize fields. So these are just some of the restraints that we have with soils. Now soils, there are different orders. And you're looking at this map and you're thinking, oh boy, this is, this is way too much to know. We're not going to take a look at all the soil orders in this class. We're only going to look at the soil orders that really relate to the topics that we're going to be talking about in here. I might mention a few of the other soil orders here and there, but really for the purposes of your upcoming quiz related to this and for the class, we're only going to talk about three or four of them. We might, by looking at these soil orders, though, see a couple of patterns developing. We have this dark green extending along in the country down through into Texas all the way up into North Dakota into Montana these are going to be if you if you know your geography this is where our grasslands were or this is our prairies this is our these are our western plains we see over in this area this orange this orange we can think of it as the desert or not the desert the southeast of the United States these are some of your more older soils. We see over here this pink salmon color. We think of this area and we think of the desert. So these are probably some type of a soil that is associated with arid climates. And we see this pinkish up in here. Well this pinkish, we're not going to get into this, but this pinkish are actually soils that are associated with volcanic deposits. So all these different soils are related to different types of materials they form in or different types of climates. We look at this, this pink, these are spodosols. These spodosols, these are, many would say, some of the best looking soils out there. These are those soils that have that really thick E horizon and are those northern, cool, moist climates that form, that have sandy soils where you get those E horizons, your spodosols. So let's take a look at these soilers in a little more detail. We're going to start with the mollusols. So mollusols 
have a really thick A horizon. Here goes your Molisol distribution. Don't worry about the sub suborders. But here goes the really thick A horizon. In this case, this is your B horizon with some of these little these little white dots in here. That's calcium carbonate. That tells me this is a little bit more of a semi-arid environment. But see the grass on there? This is a very classic uh, looking molosol, dark, dark A horizon, lots of humified organic matter, and just a little bit of uh, calcium in there to show that it's semi-arid, very much a grassland soil. These are the most fertile soils we have in the world and in this country, and that's why this country in a lot of ways does so well with agriculture is because we have such a wide swath of these really productive grassland soils, your molosols. And here goes a picture of the Molisol right here, where you can see that really thick A horizon and then the B horizon below where all that clay and calcium is found, which is really good for growing corn in. We look at Molisols and we can compare them to this, to this map right here to where in the United States we have a line. And you can see it right here. I'll draw it again. This line is about the 100th meridian. And to the west of this line, before you get to the coast, our population not only drops, but so does precipitation. And generally, if you follow this line, it kind of jogs over. If you look at this, if you look at this line in soils, to the west of this line, you start to get that calcium buildup in soils, and you gain your petal-cal soils. Over here, you get your alpha soils. These are more of your forest soils, where you have soils are constantly wet through the year. You don't have dry spells with them like you do here where they have what's known as a wetting front and all the little goodies in the soil will precipitate out and that's why you saw those little white dots in that soil before. That's that calcium in the horizon. Moving on, our next soil is going to be our alpha sols. Now alpha sols are going to be your temperate forest soils. And these temperate forest soils, we can kind of see that pattern to where when we think of Wisconsin, we think of this area as our temperate soils. This is this area that has, that's that Wisconsin dome area. Don't pay too much attention to that. We follow along here. This is that area of the country where you have all those oak forests, all those hardwoods and everything. Temperate, deciduous forests for the main part or some mixed forests. But these are your forest soils. These are actually pretty productive, healthy soils, second only to molosols in terms of their nutrients. Um, before we had steel plows, these were the soils that farmers looked to and what was coveted. It was we couldn't really get into the through the sod to farm these soils. That gets into that technology issue with what is a resource and what isn't. But alpha sols, these are your forest soils. And that's what your alpha sol looks like. Notice how much thinner the A horizon is on an alpha sol. Now these, what you might be able to tell right away, judging by their location, these are your aridosols. And aridosols are found in arid climates. Now an aridosol is, has a lot of nutrients in a lot, unless you start getting the things like a salid or a gypsid where you have these uh, salts in them. But if you were dealing with something like an argid or a kelsid, that's lots of goodies in those soils. The only problem is, is that a plant needs sun to grow, but it also needs water. And so in these areas, yeah, you have all these nutrients in the soil, but without water, you can't grow stuff. So the way around that is by irrigation. So in our in this country you'll notice that a lot of our agriculture actually will takes place in these river valleys you have the Rio Grande Valley here you have an area down here in southern Texas this is a big area along the Rio Grande for things like tomatoes this used to be a very big agricultural area until um, it became more urbanized even up here in Nevada there was a lot of agriculture that used to take place before it was urbanized and then, of course, you have some aridosols here in California, but these you start getting to um, uh, the, the more of a semi-arid soil that we're not going to cover more. 
but this is a, another arid environment that we have a lot of agriculture taking place. All these environments, though, you need irrigation to grow in them, but they're pretty healthy. So there goes your aridosol. Now another one that we mentioned before is your spodosols. Notice how the spodosols are up here without these. These are kind of a strange one down here in Florida, but up here in Maine and up here in the northern Great Lakes are your spodosols. And spodosols are characteristics of cool, moist climates, oftentimes with lots of snow associated with them. And these soils, there goes that E horizon, that leached horizon, and then this is the material that's leached out of it deposited here. If you look at it in this perspective, this is a really nice shot of one. It, it really looks like a layer of ash, and then it almost looks like coffee grounds down here. So this is all the goodies that were leached out from the soil here and deposited in this area. So if you're thinking of agriculture, this is a pretty acidic area. Not very good for agricultural production. However, pretty good for trees because the trees are going to be able to tap into all the goodies down in here. Moving on, let's talk about soil erosion. Soil erosion, there's different agents that act on soil in terms of the erosion. You have wind and you have water. By far the biggest uh, shaper of the Earth's surface and the biggest eroder of soils is water. Even when you get into these arid environments, when it rains, there's no vegetation to protect the surface, and that's really when you get a lot of the erosion taking place. Wind is kind of a constant. You get wind erosion in places like Wisconsin, especially in the winter months when there's no cover on farm fields. But for the most part, wind erosion, when it's the dominant factor, would be in some of the most arid deserts of the entire world. Now when we look at it, in terms of the types, you have your rill erosion and sheet erosion. Now rill erosion is what you might be most familiar with and this is from water erosion. That's when if you look in a farm field in the spring or after a big rain you'll see the little rills form where you have these little stream channels that form and they take away the, the topsoil. That's your rill erosion. More associated with, sh with uh, wind is your sheet erosion and that's where you think of peeling off the soil in sheets. And sheet erosion, it, it's, it's not as common to recognize, but if you're ever driving along in the winter and you don't have a lot of snow cover on a, on a field, you might see blowing uh, uh, into the road or you might see drifts on the side of the road kind of staying dark. That's the wind blowing off that topsoil in sheets. So here go some areas in the country that have experienced some particularly strong water erosion processes. And so this would be your rill erosion. When rill erosion gets really strong, you have what's known as gully erosion. And gully erosion sometimes is so bad that there's no way of even fixing it. If you get little rills forming, you can plow them over and fix it. But when you start getting into something like down here in the bottom, right, that's your gullies, that's bad news. That's That area is pretty much going to have to be abandoned. Notice that there's quite a bit of gully erosion here in the southeast. That's those really old soils. And this a lot of this came from very, very intensive plantation style agriculture where you had the tobacco, you had the cotton fields, and it was very, very intensive to where you just had the soil was worked and worked and worked. It didn't really have the nutrients. There was no cover. And in the south when it rains, it rains much harder. And you had a lot of this erosion taking place. A lot of these areas are now in pine plantation because the, the fields are really no longer productive for agriculture. Of course, you get that here as well. And in areas along the Mississippi where you have a certain kind of soil called luss and that lush soil doesn't really bond together well and you get a lot of gully erosion taking place down here in the driftless area of Wisconsin down by La Crosse and that you'll see some gully erosion taking place as well. Now this map if you might not have guessed by now is wind erosion and wind erosion is more related to your your uh, arid climates although it, like I said before it can happen in your more humid climates, especially in winter months. 
But where do we get the most wind erosion? Right down here in this area of the country, especially up here on the Llano Estacado surface of eastern New Mexico and Texas. This is this is where Lubbock, Texas is located. That's what you see up here, this big dust cloud. Those things are real. I've seen one of those in Las Cruces. And that's often leading the leading edge of a cold front moving through. And these these dust storms that come about become can have seventy mile per hour winds for several days at a time. Back in the Dust Bowl days, this is this is what people would see in places like the Panhandle of Texas and Oklahoma. Incidentally, right now they're undergoing a drought that's actually worse than the Dust Bowl days of the thirties. It's just that they're tapping into that fossil groundwater of the Ogallala Aquifer and they're not at the mercy of the drought yet. So that's your different erosion types and regions of the country where you can expect to see that type of erosion. Here's another here's another shot of uh, one of those dust clouds. This would be your sheet erosion occurring. Sheet erosion can sometimes peel off so much dust that it ends up going off here and you can see it in satellite imagery. And so in this case there was a big dust storm in Africa and the satellite was able to pick up this dust. Taking a look here, we can see some more footage of our rill erosion. So we here we have our rills in a farm field. These are going to be able to get plowed over. Over here we have them so deep that these are your gullies. And this is going to be very, very difficult to fix. You might have to just plow around this in the future. And that's that shot zoomed in. These are the same shots, just zoomed in more. So how do you prevent soil erosion? Well, you can terrace the ground, you can engage in contour plowing, you can put in what's known as a shelter belt, or you can do something called no-till agriculture, and that's where you just don't plow, and you let ground co protective ground cover built up. You can also rotate your crops. Certain crops are going to protect the soil much better than other crops. Crops like corn, to a certain degree soy, especially tobacco and cotton, the way that they're structured, they don't really protect the ground below from the velocity of raindrops, and their root structure doesn't really hold in the ground that well, and you can get a lot of soil erosion from that. But if you plant things like alfalfa or you let a field fallow, not only are you going to be able to restore nutrients, but you're going to bind that soil together and you're not going to have those issues. So these are some terraces. Uh, in the video you saw some terraces as well at the beginning of the film. These terraces are a way to stop water from flowing downhill. Of course if you look at something like these terraces you can imagine that you can't, this isn't very friendly to mechanized labor. You can't take a tractor up each one of these terraces and engage in a harvest. This is to where you're going to have to use perhaps use some type of an animal that can move around in this environment, but more likely you're going to rely on human labor for harvesting this rice when you have your terracing system. Here we have two different uh, actions going on to prevent soil erosion. We have our contour plowing, and that's where you can see how the, the fields were plowed where you're going parallel with the contours of the land or the elevation, you're not going against it to where then the water will be able to roll, go really fast down those furrows and you have further erosion. Not only do we have contour plowing, but we also have our shelter belt crops. And that's where we have crops that are going to bond the soil together much better and alternating with crops that aren't going to bond the soil together as well. So that way you have little catch areas for the sediments and you don't have all that sediment going downhill with one type of crop. Here's another shot of contour plowing and of shelter belts. Now in your next unit what you're going to do is you're going to engage in a Google Earth assignment and you're going to start to look at stuff in agriculture and you're going to take a look at actually some soil materials as well.